It's showtime. You're on. Well, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're doing it. Go ahead. Well, I'll tell you what. We had ourselves a wonderful old weekend because it was cold in Florida. It was freezing cold. You guys from up north, you don't know what, what cold means when, when you haven't lived in Florida and are sweating and you have one day of cold and you think it's the end of the world. It was nice and cool down here over the weekend. Let me guess. You had to bust out a jacket. Me, no. Like, I was basically... <laughs> Not without a shirt. I want the cold, mm -hmm. you know. I but people were dressed more fancy. Yeah. Well, yeah, you got to put on the layers, man. But uh, I just can't imagine. See, what's your definition of cold down there, though? Do you know what the temperature got down to? I don't. I didn't even look, but I was assuming it was somewhere in the mid sixties. Somewhere in the mid sixties. It was cool enough where it felt agreeable. Um, but a lot of people traditionally will bundle up, let's say, because these are people that are, remember, we're Caribbean people. Uh-huh. And Caribbean. And what happens in the Caribbean is that it's it's sweaty, you know. I almost uh -huh. I almost said it's sweaty. So when cool air comes from those great, you know, the, the tundras up north, we uh -huh. feel a relief. But most people are like, wow, this is like the end of the world. So they bundle up like if it were <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I know that feeling. Um, we lived in Hawaii for, oh, God, several years. Uh, eh, well, I say several, four years. And it stayed a constant. I mean, the difference between winter and summer in Hawaii the average temperature in the summertime is 85. The average temperature in the wintertime is 82. So right. it never got even, even remotely close. I think one evening it got down to 52. And that was it. So, you know, I, I closed the windows and we put a blanket on the bed that night. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, it just kind of... So, so I do have a little bit of experience, but not much. With that kind of thing but there are people all over the place right now going 60s are you kidding me that ain't nowhere near cold Nah. well uh it is when you're used to 80s and 90s so yeah it is in that situation because you know at the same time we'd see a lot of people coming down here especially i was working in tourism mm -hmm. and um people come here from places that were well nordic countries and um i'd take them on tours and stuff and i kid you not people would pass out just sitting on the boat yeah. They'd be like this, like swaying a little bit, and you see them knock over a little bit. And, and we'd always say, you got to hydrate, folks. You got Because we're used to living in this sort of like terrible mm. cloud mist of, of fog heat. And these people are are not, you know. And um, so they're, you know, it depends on where you're, what, where, where you um, originate from that, that you'll be able to deal with. Um, right said climate and we are kind of an extreme on on the other end of the spectrum yeah, yeah. well we would get similar things uh with folks when we lived in northern nevada you'd get folks that come up from down in the san francisco bay area or even the uh sacramento basin mm -hmm. down in there down in the central valley and we had the higher temperatures real low humidity. I mean, humidity around 10% was common. And, but then we also had altitude when you're sitting at 5,000 feet and mm -hmm. these folks just weren't used to it and just, they drop like flies sometimes. Yeah. As you get up there, you have a few drinks, alcohol hits you quicker. There's not as much oxygen in the air. The air is thinner. And the you people, the only time they hydrate is, with a mixed drink or a beer yeah and that combination and plus staying up for hours and hours gambling in the casinos that combination is a recipe for you know i can't tell you how many times we've had to call an ambulance because somebody passed out in the middle of the casino you know and it's always the same thing a combination of alcohol and altitude yeah so if you're not used to it you are not used to it so 
And yeah. uh, they, the, the joke is, well, you got to be up here for at least six months to let the blood thicken up to where you can handle the, uh, handle the cold and the uh, humidity. Because it was the desert, but still at 5,000 feet. I mean, we were 25 miles from Lake Tahoe. And that's alpine. I mean, we're talking, they measure snow in feet there. So it was cold. Closest I ever personally experienced the 15 years we lived there was five below. But, you know, you can keep that. That's why we moved. Because <laughs> I don't have to stay there now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this might go, uh, this might be a, a, a left curve or, or whatever. Um, but I'll, I'll share it unless you have something to, because I have something that. Go for might, it. Okay. So I'll just share it and we can deviate if, if you're not interested, if the folks out there aren't interested. Um, I wanted to just mention current events and um, there's a trial going on right now that is getting a little bit of uh, attention. And it's the, uh, the, what the situation that happened where a 17 year old kid went over to, um, 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 Kenosha and, um, he ended up because of, of the situation with the uh, looting and burning, yeah. uh, last year, he ended up shooting a couple of people and killing one. Um, and now they're doing this whole trial and stuff and it's on online. It's being, you know, filmed broadcast live, live, yeah, broadcast live. And, um, so there's a lot there, but I, I will say that what I find interesting and something very of our time now is that just like in the woodworking community where you have shows, you know, that people get together and talk about woodworking, I've encountered just an interesting thing how this works, the world that we live in, the digital world, you have um, lawyers, attorneys, gathering together doing like shows for court proceedings and the wealth of information and opinion and thought back and forth as they're watching the play by play as if it was you know well it is what it is uh, um it's their 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 um uh world and um you learn a lot listening to these people and and seeing the the pros and cons of certain like um you know uh uh, evidence that they put out and 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 uh, witnesses and so on. So I find it pretty interesting. Any thoughts on on that whole thing? So so basically, you're you're talking about say you have four lawyers, and they have the trial actually playing in the background, but they're commenting on what's going on as it's happening. Right. Okay. So you're getting that filter through the eyes of the attorneys. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's an interesting concept that I hadn't really thought about. Uh, I would not have thought about something. I wouldn't have thought about something like that because, you know, we all are armchair lawyers. We're all armchair quarterbacks and well, he did this. Well, but did he do that? You know, there's certain ways evidence is presented. There are certain things you can say and there's certain things you can't say. There are certain procedures. Um, and just the legalese, just the jargon is confusing to the average person. Most folks don't even pay attention to it. It's done that way for a reason. But um, it, it's that's an interesting concept that I hadn't even thought about, honestly. Yeah. Well, what's, yeah. cool, what, what's cool is that, that, that everybody with their own talents or, you know, s specific focus, uh -huh. um, be it people that make like miniature rockets or people that do ant farms mm -hmm. and whatever the case might be, um, there's ample, they, they, in this digital world that sort of moves into like things like YouTube where people right. are sharing all this stuff. So it's just an incredible thing in 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 this sort of like little mini verse uh, uh, of of a topic. You know? So so so, did you see this as an educational opportunity where you can learn a little bit more about the insight and the ins and outs of the legal system? Or 
I, I personally do because when you talk, when you listen to um, attorneys or experts, um, by the way, experts doesn't mean flawless, um, infallible, right? But it does give you an insight into a world that you're not a part of, and um, you you can glean some nice nice uh, info from it. At least a general sort of like a uh, idea of of the topic, and it's it's yes, it's informative. It's informative. Okay, okay, that's interesting. I, I I would not have thought of that take. I can see how it's right. I mean, this more cynical side of me is going, oh great, lawyer reaction videos, but the less cynical side of me is saying maybe folks will learn a little bit more about our legal system, and not be so willing to be judge and jury in the press because we have a serious problem with that. People are tried and convicted in the press before there's ever arrest. You know, that is a good point, Mark. I think that, that, that if anything, well, yes, I agree with you, but the people that are likely to just go frantic are you typically not the ones that will take the time to sit and consume a little bit more of a nuanced uh, approach? There's, there is that, yeah. but I mean, if it if it educates people, it's good. So they're not as misinformed or ill-informed, because I mean, without having experience in that world like you said it all sounds like a foreign language and it's very easy for it to sound like a foreign language and you know if you're the person on trial you just wonder when do i get a chance to present my side of the story you don't realize that there's a process and a procedure that they have to follow and it's done that way for a reason and the main reason is uniformity I mean, they, they use specific words. Some are Latin phrases, some are Greek phrases, but they're used specifically so that everybody is on the same sheet of music and there is no confusion. You know, uh, legalese is legalese because everybody was taught it, every lawyer was taught it, and they understand it. And it's not like a secret code or anything. It's done for uniformity because words have meanings and they want there to be no mistakes, no um, no confusion over a certain phrase. So I, I, I get that part, but still the attorneys watching and commenting on how they would have handled the case or how they would have presented this or why it's a bad idea to call this witness or why it's a good idea to call that witness. I can see that as nothing but educational. I mean, depending upon how they handle it, if these are a bunch of, you know, armchair quarterbacks that don't know what they're talking about, I can see how that would be just be a train wreck. But I mean, if these guys are handling it with the seriousness that it deserves, because, you know, we're talking about somebody's life here. You know, if they're handling it with the seriousness it deserves, then hey, you know, why not? Well, the the, the it, it's not just one um, channel that does. There's like with all there's all sorts of people well, doing really. this sort of like um, mm -hmm. I guess you'd call it like a, a reaction uh, play by play reaction video. Some people aren't lawyers um, that do it. I've seen. I've ran, ran across and. Um, okay. But in this particular example that I'm mentioning, these are like all, you know, attorneys um, and they do. They give they said, well, that was not a good idea. Or why don't you object to that, that the prosecutor. So there's all these things. But what's interesting is that to going back to what you said about, you know, it'll it'll help inform people, even if it's not um, a play, like a, a perfect, you know, packaged thing. Um, the fact that you see there's complexity to the process and that there's a, a, a there's a built-in process that is leaning towards fairness right. um, if you don't see that you know you're on a lynch mob so one thing that happened that they're poised depending on how the outcome is see here's the thing 
they're, they're, people are reporting, depending on on the outcome, they're preparing for war in the street, you know, fires and raging. Well, and the thing, well, the thing is about that, um, you know, these people that just go off, you know, and 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 start doing crazy stuff, um, they're they're not interested in truth. No, they're not interested in truth. They're interested. Now I would understand if it's the family of the people that got injured, let's say um, it's still inappropriate, but, but I would understand that, but like three to 4,000 people or more, um, you know, doing yeah. said rioting and whatnot. So I would just say that um, they just want an outcome that they want. Exactly. And the truth of the matter be damned. Yeah. They want their way. That's all they're interested in. They yeah. want their way. They, they've they even um, threatened. The, the judge got threat threats. Yeah. And, I know. And, but the problem is that um, he's being tried by a jury of his peers. Yeah. Um, so jurors will well, convict or, or, right. or not. But the, the judge... judge but the judge, it depends on the state, but the judge can override the jury. No. If the judge sees that there's an issue. No, he can't. The only thing that can happen is there can be a, a hung jury and they could try it again. But the judge right. cannot um, say, oh, you said he's oh, innocent. Okay. Well, no, 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 no. The judge, no, no, you're right about that. But the yeah. judge imposes sentencing. Correct. And that is an over, can be an override of the jury. I mean, it also, it depends on the state, depends on the state law. You know. Well, what they did was so what they the, what they did was that they they instructed a jury, oh. and they agree upon what the sent what the um the charges are going to be. So they did all exactly. that. They fought right. back and forth with what charges. They right. dropped a couple of charges, and right. so you know the jury gets to say innocent the, or guilty. Right. And the judge is the one that gets to put sentence. down the sentence. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, that's going to be down to what the state law is. Yeah, whatever, whatever is prescribed. The conviction is. Right. Whatever is but prescribed he can, by But law. the judge can go for the minimum or the maximum. Yeah. So, you know. I mean, at, at, <sighs> at the end of the day, it's like, it's a... Just, it's you a, know, the whole comment is that um, people are reviewing it as if it's a reaction video. I think it's a good thing because either way, I mean, we shouldn't... At the same time, whatever we see, it's like, you know, if somebody jumps off a, a bridge, does that mean you should jump off? A, if you see someone jump off a bridge right. or they tell you to jump out, would you? So anything in life, I think, um, for the most part, right, um, you don't just because you see a, a, a Rambo Part 19 uh, movie does not mean right. you're going to go out and, you know, rocket launcher uh, the the jungles next to your, you know, it, it, you you. You're, you're consuming information and, and you're learning, but you don't go crazy. But these people, I would suspect that, that when they're looking to riot, they wouldn't, they could They're not, looking for an excuse. They're looking for an excuse. Yeah. They're like the people in uh, Frankenstein, mm -hmm. the, 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 the mob. Yep. And the torches and pitchforks. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And, that's it. but <laughs> they're looking for an excuse. They're looking for a reason, you know. Yeah. That'll that's, get that's, them attention. So. Yeah. That's all I got to say about that. But, <laughs> so, but I, I found I found that particular um, angle very interesting. I personally don't know what's going to nobody does. Right. But according to what my backseat driver looking at all the stuff, I can't tell what 12 jurors are going to say. Right. But if I were one of those jurors. Yeah. <laughs> a long time ago, it was, well, you can't until they. But I, right. I mean. Just the video footage of, of what I see. That's my personal, you know, just watching. Yeah. Um, it well, just... also, we don't know everything that was presented in the courtroom. You know, I mean, unless you're watching 24-7 coverage of what goes on. And that's part of the problem with a lot of the reaction to a lot of these verdicts is that most of us don't know what goes on in the courtroom. Most right. of us don't know the nature of the evidence, don't know anything about the witnesses, don't know what witnesses were called, or even if any witnesses were called. We just know that we either got the outcome we wanted to hear, or we didn't get the outcome we wanted to hear. 
Right. And we react accordingly, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, what can you say? It's from what I saw, from what I saw and I saw the, the footage and I saw the, the back and forth with the prosecution and the, um, so from what I saw and the actual footage, um, as a matter of, and by the way, nobody wins in this thing. No. Um, but the act of self-defense, I think it's, it's, it's so, yeah. uh, it's so, um, basic yeah. human right. Um, they, they, they are arguing whether he should have personally, I don't know that it's a smart thing to, um, go to an area where there's rioting. No. It, it, um, it's not. And, the, but then again, doesn't matter. None of that is relevant. You are under no obligation to take a beating. Yeah, right. But I, I, I just wanted to say that I don't see that that it's a, a smart thing to do for a seventeen-year-old kid right. it's um, to to be in a place. So the argument that's been done is using that. But like you just said, um, all of that does not come into the. What comes in is what was happening. Mm-hmm. When it doesn't matter that I and I, I was driving towards McDonald's and I stopped in for a burger. Aha, uh-huh, we're gonna use the burger situation. No, it's at the moment of were you being attacked? Were you attacking? Did you? It's that, that exactly, moment. exactly. And, and you know, and so what I saw is the, the guy was trying to run away. The other guy, I mean, hell, um, it looks it looks like like he may not be convicted. I I of any of them. Um, however, I don't know what 12, that's why it's 12 yeah. jurors and, and, mm-hmm. and, and all that. So understanding that, you know, key point is that um, if there's rioting, it's more of the same thing. And obviously, we're not going to ever come to a point where most people well, are going to, or not most people, there's always going to be a group of people that are so just insanely ready to foam at the mouth. Mm-hmm. That you will get situations like this because they 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 don't care to um, consider nuance. No, they don't. They want their way. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And that's it. They want their way. And if not, I'm going to go out in the street and throw a temper tantrum. Right, which is you know, not too good. Which but... kind of invites more of the same. You know. Yeah. So. So what can you say? So, anyways, so. Um, what you had, you said you had. Some- well, yeah, I, this is making me think of, I wish there were more, I wish people could see examples when we're talking about how people interact with one another. And we're talking about situations of dispute where you have two people or two entities that don't agree over something, how you handle that disagreement. Have you ever heard of Hans Island? H-A-N-S. H-A-N-S. Hans. No. As in Hans and Franz. We're going to pump you up. No. No. Okay. Hans Island is a a northern Northern island. Excuse me. Um, It's in North America. And it's on something called the Nares Strait between Greenland and Canada. And I got this from our longtime viewer, Rick French. He posted a meme on Facebook. And this meme was interesting to me. And I said, that is so specific. That is so goofy. It has to be true. So I looked it up and I did a little bit of research and it is true. Um, so thank you, Rick, for bringing that to my attention. And I've been waiting to talk to you about this because this is so goofy. It's just one of those things. This better be good. Okay. Well, it, 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 it is. It is. <laughs> um, there has been a dispute between Denmark and Canada over this island. Now, it, it, it's not much of an island. It's basically a rock sticking up out of the middle of this strait. There's no source of water on it. It is solid rock. There's no beach. It's all cliff. I mean, you got, it's like a big boulder in the middle of this. The problem with it is, is that strait between Greenland and Canada, right at that point, is only 22 miles wide. 
So by international treaty and international law, the island mm -hmm. is within the territorial waters of both Canada and Greenland. Mm. So they've been having this little argument over who's in control of this island, even though there's no resources on it. I mean, the only thing there is the occasional bird. Right. Both countries claim it's theirs, but in a lighthearted way. And this started back in the 80s, started back in, I got to pull up my notes here, started back in 1984 when Canadian troops visited the island. They planted a Canadian flag and left a little sign that said, welcome to Canada. And they left a bottle of Canadian whiskey at the base of that flag. The following year, one of the, okay, now, um, Greenland is a, it's an autonomous country, but it's under the control of the Danish. They're, they're considered to be a part of Denmark. Well, uh, one of the high muckety mucks in, uh, in Denmark heard about this. So he went to the island himself. This is one of the foreign ministers. Took down the Canadian flag, put up a Danish flag put up a sign that says, welcome to Denmark and left a bottle of Danish schnapps at the base of the flag. So basically what has been happening every year since 1984 is every year one or the other goes back to that Island, changes the flag, changes the sign and leaves a bottle of booze from their country. And that's how they've run this border dispute since 1984 you don't want to know what i think is they swap flags they swap booze and they put up a sign for their own country you don't want and, to know the first thoughts that came in my mind and i here i'm wondering why can't border disputes be settled that way <laughs> oh I mean, goodness i mean they're having fun with it both of them know that there really is there's no resources on this thing I mean, looking at it, um, that's not what Americans would do. I can tell you that much. Well, it, it, it just depends. <laughs> um, it is literally a rock. I mean, it's, it's yeah, but there's it's our nothing rock. there. See, see, but that's the thing. It may be a <laughs> rock to you, but it's our rock. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, there are some there are some that say you could put a uh, a uh, weather station there. I don't know how you would man it because there's nothing there. There's no source of water. You'd have to you'd have to bring in everything. Um, it'd be a good early warning station or what have you. Eh, maybe, maybe not. But there is really no. Um, there's really no, nothing there. So, I mean, literally. That's that's interesting. They're having fun with it and stuff. And, well, they if are. the world were more that way, there'd be no, you know what? There'd be no more pistola shootouts. And, like, you know, uh, it, it, I could, you know what I see? I see a, a couple of hippie a hippies get, doing a little fun project. That's what I see in my mind. Whereas Basically, in America, yes. In America, I, I, you know what I, I, I <laughs> or well, America, the United States, I would see, I would see it completely. It would be a complete different story, in my opinion. Well, but we, we have something similar in the U.S. Okay, the Rio Grande has changed uh, courses, and it, it floods, and it recedes, and it floods, and it recedes, and what have you. And this we're talking about down in the U.S.-Mexico border in uh, yes. uh, Texas. It's. Not as easy now, but it used to be in the 60s, 70s, and through the mid 80s, when the river was at its lowest point, that is the border. Neither side has any real control of what happens. So there were bunches of people who would go out onto these little sandbars out in the middle of the river mm -hmm. and just party like crazy and do whatever they wanted to because... Yeah there was no law enforcement from either side to stop them. So it was kind of a no man's land where there was, I mean, I won't say it was total lawlessness or anything like that, but let's just say 
acceptable behavior was the least of their worries and controlled substances were the least of their worries either because right. neither side would do anything. Now, once they got back into the U.S. or back into Mexico, if that's the side they came from, then you're subject to whatever that that law enforcement has to say. So you could stand in the middle of the river and and do your 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 drugs and then go they, back. They did it for decades. They did it for decades. There were notorious parties. I shouldn't say notorious. There were huge, loud, well-known parties out there on some of these sandbars out in the middle of the river when the river was low enough to where you could get out there and not sink in the mud. And I mean, some of them had very sophisticated ways of getting out there. I mean, one dude would get out onto the sandbar and they'd rig up pulleys with ropes and, you know, put a bunch of equipment on a plywood and uh, a plywood and uh, foam barge and drag it across the river and then drag it back, you know, to bring more stuff and more people over. I mean, they'd get out there with generators and sound systems and the whole ding dong thing. Some of these sandbars are huge. Damn. And I mean, we're talking big parties with a few hundred people, you know. So we have a similar situation of no man's land, but neither side is trying to actively claim it. So, right. Well, but I mean, um, I don't know. I think border disputes should be settled that way because, I mean, is colonization really a, is it even a thing anymore? Yeah. You know? It is. <laughs> Are there still countries looking to colonize on other continents? Um, I believe at least in, what would you say the word is? The word would be accusation so in our press um the accusation is and i don't necessarily doubt it um either way anyhow um that russia is quite hard up on some of its um former territories yeah and that china is also hard up on china is also hard up on um, some places in the um, what you call the, um, uh, in the in Asia there in the central central in Asia. the Pacific yeah yeah um, the, I know there are border disputes between China and uh, Russia there are border disputes with Japan and Russia as well um, about territory that was won or lost during whichever war or what have you or occupied now or what they consider to be occupied like China considers Taiwan to be uh, Theirs. Uh, theirs as a part of China, that they are a rogue province. And we have stopped this far from recognizing them as a sovereign nation. We really can't because we don't want to cheese off mainland China. That's just too many people to deal with right now. Thank you very much. But that's been that that's been the policy since China closed down after World War II. So but I mean, the imperial uh, aspirations of colonizing, you know, other countries, I don't really think is a thing anymore. And I'm not talking about political influence because there's going to be political influence. There's going to be a back and forth there. I'm talking about actually physically, you yeah. know, uh, yeah, America or uh, the UK, the British Empire or Japan or Germany going to occupy another nation. I don't see that as a thing nowadays. Do you? No, well, not in terms of other than what we've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, because they did bring in, remember, um, other than the examples we gave and some others we haven't mentioned, like let's mm -hmm. say, um, going into Kuwait back in the 90s, um, just stuff right. like that, mm -hmm. um, and maybe places in Africa that would try. Um, yeah. I don't know that Western nations, it's no longer a situation in terms of that, at least for for the most part. But um, yeah. I, I think if the opportunity presented itself, I don't see why, because land is rare. 
True. It's 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 a com- commodity, and um, I don't know that. So I think borders are going to be basically roughly going to stay the same, but they haven't always been the same until the last couple of centuries, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they're always in flux uh, or have been traditionally. I mean, when you go back through all of the various empires from the Ottoman, go back to the, uh, you know, the Holy Roman, then the Roman, then the Greek. And I mean, how many empires have there been? It's always been in flux we've kind of stabilized or have stabilized over the last eh, hundred years to where it's, you know, the Soviet breakup of the Soviet union, notwithstanding it's more or less. And then the breakup of Yugoslavia, now that I think about it, but that was kind of throwing off a colonial power. It's kind of like the decolonization of Africa where it was French Guiana. Now it's just, it's not anymore. Or there was, um, you know, um, the Belgian Republic of the Congo, it's not anymore. I mean, just so many Western powers have pulled out of Africa, you know, that I don't know if that was due to quote unquote good conscience or if it was a threatened revolution or all of the above. No, but it's I, just I, like colonization is not a thing anymore. No, good conscience. I, I personally, you can throw that one out the door. Good conscience, nothing. That that's like bottom. Uh, that that's like the last. Uh, it's all it's all for a reason. Other, <laughs> yeah. It's it's all it's all for a reason other than good conscience. I can yeah. I can I, I would bet money on that one. <laughs> well, you know, before you could look at a map of Africa and you can tell which nation was exploiting them, and now you don't know who's exploiting them other than the dictator of the day. You know, your supreme leader du jour. Spain but, has territories in northern africa Mm -hmm. um where it's a whole whole cities um and to this day that it's claimed you know by spain you cross outside of it Mm -hmm. and then the names change you know right to to the uh local uh areas but to this day they have territory there don't they have little Areas uh, like little enclaves of uh, they're like little land. Uh, they're right, like little, yeah, yeah, right there in Morocco. Yeah, right along the coastline. Yeah. Yes, they have little enclaves yeah. and stuff, and and uh, so that whole just... enclave thing is is strange to me. I mean, yeah. how you could they have were... a country within the borders of another country? No, but they're on the ocean. Well, I get it. I, I do understand that. But I mean, if you look at, um, oh, geez, if you look at uh, in Belgium, there is the, um, there are like 4,000 enclaves of Dutch property within Belgium, but it's not Belgium. Within the borders of Belgium, there are these little areas set aside that are actually the Netherlands even though it's deep inside of Belgium and there's 4,000 of them and they've kind of treated that as a joke as well, but they're accepted under treaty, but you still have things that happen, you know, where you've got a house that's just two thirds of the front door is in Belgium and one third is in the Netherlands. You know, you have restaurants that have been there for hundreds of years that one side of it is in the Netherlands and the other side of it is in Belgium and they both have different last call hours. So you might be in the middle of a meal and they have to get you up, move you over to a table on the other side where they can stay open an hour later. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of goofy stuff like that. And I, I, I don't get why that territory, why that property is so important to the Netherlands when they have plenty of their own, I don't understand why that is so important to them that they want to maintain that, not just say, Hey, it's within the border of Belgium. You know, it's Belgium now. In the 1500s through the 1600s. Um, I wrote a post about it cause I was reading into it. Um, due to, you know, the, uh, uh, no nobility, Royal, 
royalty um, of the uh, Habsburgs, I think it was of the Habsburgs, um, Spain came into power of all that area. Um, yeah. um, the, the lowlands, right? Um, yeah. And um, reading, like I didn't go into it too, too much. I gave like a little excerpt um because i was studying it but um reading into it the people the dutch were not very pleased with how um the politics were you know sizing up uh because they wanted their particular independence and um so long story short they've always been fought at by, by every although it wasn't necessarily uh a, it was there were fights that the spanish did go in and actually now remembering um at the time the literature that was that was written there was a lot of fear and to this day they say i don't know if this is true i've not talked to it but that there's traditional uh oral histories that right. a lot of them uh dutch people um believe that the Spanish came in and raped their women and impregnated their women. And then a lot of the, um, the descendants, if, if a Dutch person has dark hair, all of a sudden they're like, Oh, this one must've been one from the, the rape. And, um, they did an autosomal test. They did, a, I'm sorry, a test uh -huh. to see if, if, if there's something to it. Cause supposedly, and I don't know how far back I just read up on all of that, uh, a few days ago. Right. Um, that the, the Dutch still have in their mind that there was this event and there was an event, right. but they wanted to know on a scientific level, if the Dutch, these people, some of these Dutch, they come out with this, this dark, it's kind of like the, um, the black Irish uh -huh. that you had, that you had told me about that one time. Well, so they did an autosomal test or a test, I'm sorry, DNA wise. And they, they found that no, these people are Dutch. Uh -huh. It just so happens that they have black hair. It just so happens that they have, you know, uh, dark eyes. features. It just so happens to be a European. Uh, it's part of being European. It's not always yeah. the Nordic blonde. That's not part of the deal. You don't have to be Nordic yeah. um, to be European. But um, they have this trauma. And even after that was said, they're still like, no, the history. And yes, in fact, um, there was, there was, you know, warring in that area. But they weren't the only ones. There were... Um, the Russians, I think, also had, uh, you know, attacks. Yeah. I think that the, the, not the French, but the, um, Portuguese. Yeah. No, no, the Portuguese, the Portuguese were there too, but I think right. that it was the, um, under Napoleon, he tried, but didn't get there. Mm -hmm. The area is coveted. The Dutch yeah. area is coveted. It's, you know, mm -hmm. well, at um, one time they were one of the major trading kingdoms, you know, one of the major trading empires. So, yeah, I mean, it was the English versus the Spanish, and they were all against the Dutch. And the Portuguese went along for the ride. They had a major trading kingdom. I mean, they were huge players on the world stage. I mean, the Portuguese empire was pretty big. It covered a massive swath of Africa. And for the longest time, they held the, the reins on the spice trade. You know, yeah. until um, a the, the Spanish discovered a new route to India, then they didn't need the Portuguese anymore. So, but, and then they more or less, the Dutch came along and more or less stole the spice trade. <laughs> but what the heck? But, but the whole thing about territory and mm -hmm. stuff, um, I don't know that anymore it's to that degree, but um, I'm sure if the opportunity presented itself... Well, I don't know that any nation would turn a blind eye to acquiring more considering well, how, you know, um, gluttonous um, well, people that seek power are. If there's know. a resource there, I, I, I would probably tend to agree with you. If there's something of value there. Oh no. If it's a rock in the middle of nowhere, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. You know, and, and yeah, and I'm not talking about Hans Island. I'm I'm talking about um, look at Guam getting territory. Yes, but Guam is an American protectorate. It's not a state, um, more or less like uh, American Samoa is. 
it's it's a protectorate it's not a state same with puerto rico you know yeah they have um limited powers and limited say in the government they don't have senators they don't have congress people they do have representation but they have very very limited powers because they are sovereign nations and all they have to do is say no we don't want your protection anymore get out and we'll get out i think they've tried that in puerto rico and um, there's a strong push for what they call i i, don't, I can't i'm not going to speak for but I think it's an idea of independence or sovereignty, this right. or that. But um, and I'm not sure if this is a fact, but I think it is that I've I've read if a Puerto Rican is on the island, I'm not sure. I don't know that they can vote for president. But uh, if they go to, the, if they live in the states, they can. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I think that's kind of true. Um, I. I I, I don't remember how that works, but yeah. um, I, I, I'll just say mm -hmm. that throughout my lifetime, there has been that kind of talk in both directions. There have been votes on statehood and there have been votes on complete independence and total sovereignty without American intervention. And they both have failed. So the overwhelming majority of the people want to keep the status quo and just leave things the way they are. You know? Yeah. And that changes from generation to generation. You know, the percentages go up and down, but it's still maintained a minority. It's, it's a minority of people want statehood and a minority of people want to cut, sever ties with uh, the U.S. So, but ultimately it is up to them, you know. It's up to I them mean, if there's consensus enough that they would yeah. want that either way. I mean, it happened with the Philippines, you know. The, oh yeah, that's right. It was returned to yeah. their whatever their form of um yeah. And yeah. Uh, we didn't we didn't sever all ties, but they're no longer considered a US territory or a US protectorate. So. Yeah, so as far as these these locations um and being I, I don't I agree with you, but there are questionable areas with certain people that sure. do want and I think that all maybe now, maybe I, I think that all um, disputes occur mm -hmm. now within the realm of international trade and, um, you know, resources, tariffs and 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 and, and shipping well, and stuff like I think it's an economic, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe sort of like land sales and international. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I think war and intellectual property, I think it's on that scale now, as opposed to, you know, actual physical war. I think you're right. Um, you, me, Greg, the snow crusher, and a couple of other people, we were in a, we were in a hangout one day and we were talking about areas that are within you know, right along the Canadian U S border and that there were like certain towns that, um, half of it was on the U S side, half of it was on the Canadian side. And it was illegal. If you're driving down the road, heading East, you're on the U S side. But if you wanted to go to this gas station, you have to turn left. That gas station's on the Canadian side. And you legally can't do that. You have to go down to the border checkpoint and everything else. And we were looking at that kind of a thing. And I don't know if you remember, we found a little place in the state of Washington called Point Roberts. I don't know if you remember this or not. I remember it. It's right. It, it's up in the far north of the state. It's uh, south of Vancouver, British Columbia. And it's out in what's called the uh, Strait of Georgia. Okay. And it's just the tip of a little peninsula in Canada. But it's just the tip of that peninsula. And there are maybe a dozen streets on it. Mm -hmm. And people live on this thing. Yeah. But And they're U.S. citizens. 
And in order to do anything, to go anywhere, they have to go through a border crossing checkpoint to get off of that point. Unless yeah. they take a boat and go into, uh, go across quite a bit of water the uh, on the Strait of Georgia there and go into the U.S. Now, to me, that's insanity. That really is insanity. Now, I'm not going to talk about, um, and there is a ferry, by the way, I should add that. There is a ferry and a highway. But um, what is the U.S.'s interest in keeping that land? Why are we holding on to that? I don't get it. Because I, people I, live I there. I really don't get it. I, I know that. I understand. But when i guess my my question is more to the people of the past when they drew that border there why keep that little piece i i, I don't i really don't understand well but on, on one level not the level that we're but on one level this is not the level but on one level if you wherever you go in general, unless you particularly relinquish it, you're always American. And if you've lived, because I would assume that these people aren't like, I think transients, let's say, I think that they've been living there maybe for generations. I don't yeah, know that, but yeah, they, um, they've been there for a while and these are, you know, well-established homes and what have you. Yeah. So there is such a thing as the tradition. So, the tradition of well they're american it doesn't matter where the sure. heck they they could be on you know what i'm saying it, it's, it's like you you can't strip that away so i think no you you can't has, and i don't go ahead i'm sorry no i just i think that it has something to the why it just remains is it's it's like hey this is ours we've always been here screw right. you and that's it and, and i don't I, think the others are asking for it either and there may be something to that there may be a lot of that uh, by now, but you would think just the logistics of getting from point A to point B, because to do anything, to leave that island, unless you've got a decent boat, you have to go into Canada to get back to the U.S., whether it be on the ferry or on the highway or anything, unless you have a decent sized boat, because we're talking about we're not talking about going across the river. We're talking about a major channel Let between the this. U.S. and Canada. Let I mean, me I'm, I'm just wondering why the Canadian government has not offered to buy those properties there. Let me ask you this mm -hmm. on the heels of that. Okay. Before I lose it. Okay. Before I lose it. So this may be not answerable or it might lead to something fun just for the hell of it mm -hmm. within the topic. Ha saying that, that you just said, people that live in an area that's adjacent to another country. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming bleeds it bleeds in cultural norms from the surrounding areas. Um, there's like a a bit of there's influence. Let's say um, there's I don't know to what degree in this and that, but I would I would assume someone from that place mm -hmm. um, has certain little things. Mm -hmm. Culturally speaking, I don't know to what extent that would be completely different in uh, that, that those terms to someone living in Virginia, let's say. Right. Um, so here's my question. So and we do know, like what you said, there's other places up in Canada. And, and so my question is this. It might be begging the question. Are those people fully. American culturally does it matter at all and what is where can we look towards the actual orb of culturally American territorially and culturally uh, what you're talking about right there is human geography and human geography cultural geography transcends borders um, there really aren't any borders you can be you can you can move to Spain and live there for the rest of your life and just be as American as you are today. You could move to Iceland 
and be just American as you are today. So that really holds, there, there really are no borders. As far as living right on the border, like you're talking about, I'm sure they have absorbed a lot of the Canadian culture. I'm sure Canadian slang, maybe accents or dialects, um, simple things like spelling or, you know, saying certain words with a certain stress here and there. So, yeah, I can see how that is. I mean, you, you have a, a blending and a melding of cultures because you're right there close in close proximity. How American are they? They're as American as you and me if they, you know, if they're American. Um, so, you know, you, you, <sighs> I think that's I think that's right. I, I agree with that. Um, but I wanted to see what, you know, you were. But how about the other part? Is there one place? I mean, it begs a question because you've just. Is there one place you could say is the nucleus of where all roads intersect? You know how they say all roads lead to Rome. Right. Um, and this goes to expats. You know, mm -hmm. you've seen videos of people. I live. I was born in America and I lived here all and I lived there all my life, but I moved to um I don't know uh Ecuador and now I've got uh this 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 house over here sitting on yeah. a cliff and, and stuff like that. Um he, he he's he's exporting himself right. with all that it is that he is, but he's in a different place. But that's different than someone that lives in, in like next to Canada, let's say, or um boy, I don't know in uh, whatever any place that that's on the on the board what would be all roads lead to rome in reference to america or is there, there isn't one there isn't one there isn't one and that's because we're not all the same i mean um let's take ancestry out of the equation but the northeast is as different from the southwest as Miami is from the Pacific Northwest. I think that has to do also, in, an ancestry is influenced in it. Yes, it is. But, you know, it, the whole vibe, the climate, the local resources. Yes. A lot of the customs are based on resources that they had at hand. Like up here in the Pacific Northwest, they eat a lot of fish, a lot of salmon specifically, because there's a lot of it here down where you're at is not so much salmon there is no, some. There's, there's none <laughs> so there's none you know, just culturally there there's a huge difference you yeah. know i can go get smoked salmon right now you might be able to in a specialty shop and it's you're going to pay an arm and a leg for it because they have to bring it into you um so but you also then we bring ancestry into it yeah. you have different different peoples have settled in different areas. So, you know, the uh, culture in and around Chicago is completely different from the culture in and around Philadelphia, which is completely different from the culture down in Baton Rouge or New Orleans, which is completely different from Houston. They're not that far apart, but culturally they're worlds away. So I don't think there is any one nucleus of American. You can put a border around America and say, there it is. But you can't really say these people are... The official... Yeah, Americans, because we all are. It's it's as varied as you want to make it. I mean, the, the people who live in Chinatown and San Francisco are just as American as you and me. So... They're just steeped me... in a different culture. Okay, so let me ask you this then with that. Um, and I agree. I agree. I mean, it's obvious if one were to ponder, I think that that's a, a fair conclusion for, for mm -hmm. very, for very uh, obvious reason. But um, let me ask you this then. I think everybody can do this for the most part. Can you, or have, for the most part, can you pick out an American 
and I know there's iffy situations, right? Because there's there's people that make. But can you pick up, regardless of region, just by what you've seen by your travels or TV or popular culture, just growing up, um, can you pick out when someone is in, is an American um, by certain? Because what I, what it is is you, you you. This is the question. What it is is that, and I've mentioned this before, across the country. There's all these variations, but there's also a something I can't quite never been able to. It's there, but there's all these variations in culture and maybe mm -hmm. these people like this, those people like that and all walks of life. But there's some sort of glue where you can sort of sort of like suss out um whether it's on TV this is, or at interviews, if a person's Canadian, you can hear a slight little thing and you say, aha, uh -huh. even sitting back on your, in your chair. And the opposite is true with, um, with yeah. uh, trying to suss out who's, you know, oh, this is an American. Maybe it's a different person, but you can tell by some sort of cultural. There, there, there are some common things that we do here and it all comes down to space. This country, a few towns notwithstanding, um, you know, there's not a lot of space in Southern California or New York or Philly or Chicago where people are packed pretty densely together. But yeah. even then, Americans, when that, because, you know, just going down to uh, Mainz, Germany in the middle of uh, Saturday or Sunday, all the stores are closed. And, but the place is jam packed crowded because they love to people watch. They're very fashion conscious. So downtown is just jam packed with people just walking around watching people, seeing what everybody's wearing and just getting out and enjoying, yeah. you know, not for the purpose of shopping. And we did it a few times as well. And you could spot the Americans by the way they walked. They're more outgoing. They're not so much aggressive but they're more expressive in the way they walk. They tend to swing their arms and occupy a little bit more space on the sidewalk than other folks do. Germans are very closed. Elbows in, arms crossed in front of you, head down and you walk. Americans aren't that way. They're looking around. Their arms are down by their sides. And there's a more expressiveness in the way they walk. And I've seen that amongst like U.S. troops of every ethnicity walking around downtown, my friends and total strangers alike. You could sit there on like a step of a church or something like that and watch a crowd and go, that's an American, that's an American, that's an American, just by the way they walk. Right, regardless of, and, and regardless of, so I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, it's, I'm laughing at what you just said with the walking and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So back in the day we were, we finally were given in the Everglades when we were driving airboats. Um, we used to use cell phones to call into base or station if we were running into some problems. Out, we, it could be running out of gas, uh, the propeller, uh, you know, blew blew off. Mm -hmm. um, any number of things. You got stuck. Any number of things, and we'd carry it in a plastic little baggie so it wouldn't get wet. Mm -hmm. You know, because those things were expensive. Well, we finally got. Um, radios, walkie talkies, mm -hmm. and we got a, a, a nice, um, you know, place to holster the walkie talkie on the side and stuff. And, um, and I caught myself doing it too. It's freaking hilarious. Um, and we had this, this uh, new worker there, and he was a Nicaraguan guy um, training to be a, a tour guide. Um, I forget his name now, but he was there and stuff. And, um, we're all walking around. We've got our new walkie talkies on our belts and stuff. And I'd walk out. I have my walkie talkie. The other guy has his. And the, the the Nicaraguan guy comes around and says, "You guys are hilarious. You're walking around like 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 the 1950s cowboys. Like the walkie talkie. You're brandishing a, a gun on your side because we did. We were walking <laughs> ever since we had the walkie talkies. Our legs were wider apart." when we walked and our hands were always like this ready. So we all grew up watching too many Westerns and you yes. can, and he caught it. And when he told me about it and I looked around and I saw myself, yeah. I was walking around like, like I was ready to, to go, you know, draw on some, 
I started peeing my pants laughing right there, dude. Americans, right there. we it's so funny, dude. You cannot deny we have swagger. We have swagger. <laughs> we strut. We 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 just know we're the coolest. So the augmentation. So I guess so. Prior to the walkie-talkie, um, we would walk kind of like normal, whatever. But that gave us a little push into exaggerate yeah. and plus we're wearing uniforms and stuff so we, we were we, we were always hoping for 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 a weapon <laughs> yeah and now and now we had something that's not deadly at all but we could, could use call it for like help <laughs> it was hilarious dude it was and, yeah. and he caught it and he made me laugh man it was great uh yeah, you have that, to be there to really appreciate yeah, the joke. i do appreciate it because he's 100 percent right americans do have swagger and if you give us an accessory we'll add to that swagger the other thing that you could count on was baseball caps americans love baseball caps now there are it, there are other people in other nations that do wear them but they just never caught on overseas the way they've caught on in the u.s yeah you know, maybe our friend Greg can let us know about baseball caps in Canada. But down here, if you walk into any store and you look around, the first 20 people you see, half of them will be wearing a baseball cap. It's I'm so common that I don't you. even pay it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so common. I don't pay attention. Right. But because it's, it's that common. But it stands out like a sore thumb in any other country that I've ever visited anyway. You know, be it France, Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium. The only people wearing baseball caps were Americans. Now, then again, that was 20, 30 years ago because we left in uh, 92. So it's been a while. So who knows? Yeah. So who knows what it is now? Because right. American pop culture knows no borders either. American pop culture goes ends up in some of the weirdest places. Uh, well... So. There's weird. Well, see, it depends because it's 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 from the point of view. Um, because over for some, so I'll say this: uh, doing airboat tours uh, for over ten years, um, you get to see a lot of stuff, and people do have cultural things that are regional. So I'm not oblivious to these this topic that we're talking about because I actually um, experience it day by day having people throngs of people in in huge tourist buses being yeah. dropped off and uh, working from the morning to the evening seeing all this um i remember seeing like people coming from like russia let's say uh -huh. and all that was missing was like a fur coat but they had the the the, the jewelry pearls uh, dress and it was like um not necessarily 100 percent appropriate for the uh event that was going on let's say as an example right but i, I did so you could see these things you know whereas um the american would would wear a, a t-shirt and some mm -hmm. shorts maybe and a yeah. cap right yeah um and that was a typical thing um s some were a little bit more you know they they like to to, to have the belt buckle and the mm -hmm. this and that and maybe the boots and stuff but within the context of of casual let's say right um and the italians Dude, not all of them, but they were always, dude, and you have to see it, on the cutting edge of fashion. And it doesn't matter. You're out in the Everglades sweating your nuts off. They were, they, they'd wear, it, it's, it's, it's as if they were going to an arts festival always. And I'm talking like, like, like certain types of pants that were huggy, huggy pants. I don't even know what the word is. They write up. It's kind of like they're going sailing or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It was hilarious, and and you you just you start to see those patterns and stuff. But anyway, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Anyways, uh, let's wrap this up. Okay. If, if unless you have something else. Nope, I don't have anything else for this week. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Hans Island because I think personally, a bottle of booze, a handshake, and a smile is the best way to handle a border dispute. Yeah, just my opinion. Well, I mean, it's the least lethal way. Yeah. And yeah. if you don't solve the issue, so long as everybody's happy to trade back and forth once a year, no issue. Yeah. You would not have made a, a great uh, a great soldier necessarily back in the um, like 15, 16, 1700s because you say, folks, why battle this one? Well, Let's you know what? I didn't say that when I was in the Army 20 years ago either. 
but I, I, well, that you're right. And I'm not trying to, I'm just saying yeah. that, 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 that piece and, and, and uh-huh. that sort of thing, that's the ideal. Sure. But like, they'll take us, you which, know, which, which is why it's remarkable and which is why it's fun to see people actually putting it into play. Yeah, you're right. And you know what? Is it really worth killing millions of people? Not that rock, no. Not that you know what rock. I'm saying? Yeah. Is it really worth? It? And now I'm sure there's and, people that are gun ho on that one, but and but the thing about it is, is both sides know that. That's why they're taking part in this untraditional tradition. You know, yeah. they both realize that this really doesn't. At the end of the day, this really doesn't matter. So let's have some fun with it. You know, yes, we do need to solve it. We do need to sit down and discuss it. And maybe we do need to uh, sign a new treaty or at least establish where the boundary actually is. But until then, eh, there's more important things to worry about right now. We'll leave it on that high note because (laughs) I think that that's I think that's the best way to go about it. But then again, what do I know? I think so. We'll leave it on that high note because that's. It's better to live than than to um, sure. fade away. <laughs> All right. So, listen, we go live every Tuesday, 930 Eastern, 630 Pacific time. We're the Trampled Underfoot podcast show here on YouTube. You can catch us here at our channel. And um, we also have a website by the same name, Trampled Underfoot podcast.com you can catch our past episodes there and we typically post when you know something uh, catches our eye of importance we'll usually drop some links over <coughs> and some photos over on our facebook page by the same name so um keep that in mind you guys have a great rest of the week and by the way we're also sponsored by Steve Nealon over at Harneal Media, your one-stop website shop. If you're looking to improve your online presence, you want to move beyond social media, maybe you have a lot to say, maybe you don't have much to say. Maybe you want to set up a web store where you can sell your items, your crafts, your projects, or maybe you would like to design merch and sell t-shirts, baseball caps, coffee mugs things of that nature. Steve can set you up with a print on demand service that will handle all of that. They take care of the stock, the inventory, the shipping, everything. You just promote your website and sit back and watch the orders come in. Steve will do as much or as little as you want him to do. If you're experienced in running a website and just looking for a host, Steve is the man to talk to. That's Harneal Media, H-A-R-N-E-A-L, media.com. Sponsor of trampledunderfootpodcast.com. All right. Catch you guys next time. Have a great week. We're out of here. Take care. All right. <laughs> it worked last time. I gave it a nice um, long pause and I could find it so I can get rid of the stuff that we don't use for the actual edit on the uh, the, yeah. uh, the other part. Yeah, I get it. I, I do understand because I, I just did this last edit and we had a real long break and it was real easy to spot as soon as I loaded it into the software. It yeah. was like, oh, there it is. And I went and found it, clip, delete all yeah. the rest of that stuff. Yeah, because you want to focus on the on the stuff. Right. And that stuff is this stuff that we're going to do right now. Um, I was asking, I said, maybe Greg can tell us if they're wearing baseball caps in uh, in Canada. And see, I have the power to do this now. We set up a new thing with StreamYard. This is so cool. Uh, Greg says, yeah, they wear them up here, but mostly the wrong way around now. Well, they're wearing them backwards here, too. Yeah. So. Um, let's see. We wear toques in the winter and slide downhill on our toboggans. Okay. Yeah. We, we wear stocking caps and cause you ask somebody what a toque is and they're like, isn't that that bird on the fruit loops cereal? I box? don't know what a toque is. Uh, it's a, it's a knit hat. It's a stocking cap. Oh, you and, mean a toque uh, is like, like just those, those typical stretchy sort of, yeah, um... the knit hat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of us call them beanies. Uh, but we also slide downhill on our toboggans. Uh, that's I don't think that's us that calls the knit hats a toboggan. 
I've heard those knit hats called toboggans, but I don't remember who it was that did it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Greg also says that you are salmon deficient. That explains it. Greg is always trying to, what's the word, um, um, pick a fight. You're trying to create an international. See, everything we talked about in this episode <laughs> was about peace, love, harmony. And Greg mm -hmm. is just looking to start fights. I think that 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 that's easy to do up in his winter retreat, mm -hmm. okay, far away from border disputes and such. But um, yeah. salmon deficient. I am salmon. Well, I'll tell you what. I love salmon, and I am salmon deficient. But we can go to Walmart and get ourselves, you know, yeah. salmon. Fresh frozen. Fresh from the freezer. Yeah. 30-day-old uh, salmon. Rick French, thank you for that meme for uh, Hans Island. That's You're exactly right. You're the one that posted that meme, and I saw it. Uh, he says, go to a woodworker show. You are nothing unless you have a six-inch sterile rule. Stare it rule in your breast pocket. Yeah. Yes. I agree. You got to have a six inch Starrett rule sticking out of your pocket, you know, or, or a 12 foot. It used to be a 12 foot Lufkin tape on your hip. You, you, what, what's it called? Uh, a a st Starrett six inch ruler. A Starrett? Starrett yeah. six inch. So you need a Starrett six inch ruler to be taken serious. Well, that's what he says. Yeah. But that, you know, <laughs> that I was going to say a dirty joke, but continue. Yeah. <laughs> it was gonna be good. 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 Um, now, uh, totally apropos of nothing, um, Dan says uh, I seriously may go to Hawaii in two weeks. Evidently, he has a bed there that needs repair, so he may have to go to Hawaii to repair a bed. Tough gig, but nice if you can get it. And Greg wants to know, are you going to stay long enough to get a tan? You have to remember that Dan is finished. He'll get a tan on the plane. So. <laughs> that that would be a, a nice thing to, if, to record. That would be a nice little thing to, I know you're there to work, but um, that would be nice to, because that's kind of odd. You're going all the way there to fix a bed. Are there no Dude. islanders that can fix a bed? Dude, it's his product. He's going there to work on his product. I mean, you're going to let just anybody? I mean, if you if you made what Dan made, you've seen his work. If you if if it's a problem with anything, just add a little bit of avocado on uh, cream, you know, just dab a little bit and and it, it'll hide any blemish. See, this is why you're not working for Dan right now. <laughs> Rub a little avocado on the green. <laughs> it, it works as filler. See, you guys don't know the chemistry involved behind it. I guess I don't because I have never, ever, ever rubbed an avocado. <laughs> uh, Dan says, <laughs> never Dan says, yes, it's a warranty job, really. <laughs> well, I so, mean, hell. You know, I mean, there were worse gigs. It it could be a heck of a lot worse, Dan. Yeah, but how does that see? I have I have all sorts of questions about this situation. All sorts of questions, I tell you. There's so much in my mind thinking, I, well, I'll just leave it that I have all sorts of questions about the, this situation. The first one being, Dan, do you need a helper? No. <laughs> I you know, look. I don't, I'm not going to Hawaii to freaking work. Are you kidding me? Well, you know what, Dan? What I, so is the coffee, is the coffee and room and board free? Then, then we can, we can talk here. Yeah, you can have Plus, it. In, I need overtime. You can have it in lieu of pay. <laughs> <laughs> Ramen noodles fixes everything. Um, yeah, but you got to have a place to cook and eat those noodles. <laughs> <laughs> Dan says, I will leave my home for any reason. Eloy's on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> I'm a homeboy. Yeah, not saying you're a hermit, but you're that far from it. I'm a homeboy. And and you know what? I have 
very, very little, sh actually no shame whatsoever in it. I know what I don't want. And I know what I, I, well, I know what I don't want. Yeah. Well, literally, you know. I know what I don't want so much. Literally. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, my wife, Linda, says uh, the other way you could tell U.S. military personnel was they always wore white socks. Germans wore dark socks. See, right. I never really paid attention to that. And it wasn't we'd been there for a couple of years before she mentioned that to me. But, yeah, um, the G.I.s wore the Americans tended to wear white socks. And we you know, the 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 white cotton athletic socks specifically with the, with the stripes. Some with, some without. The, yeah. the, the German summer is about two and a half weeks long. That That's about how much good, nice, warm weather they get. So there weren't many opportunities to walk around in shorts. But when you did have the opportunity to walk around outside in shorts, you would see the Americans were wearing white, the white athletic socks, some with the stripes, some without the stripes. But the Germans, no matter what, they wore dark side, dark socks the like the um polyester ones like you would wear with dress shoes um let me just mention this and i think you you partook in this mm -hmm. you definitely had to have partaken in this all of you guys out there i, I would assume back in the day 100 percent, the idea was to wear the socks those type of socks pulled all the way up if you had shorts, so be it. Mm -hmm. Your socks were all the way up, and you'd walk around, and your socks were all the way up. And at some point, it became a fashion no-no. Yeah. And it was a big-time fashion no-no. It was yeah. associated with being nerdy, associated mm -hmm. with all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in the in the late 80s or early 90s, maybe. Right. Yeah. Believe it or not, it was fashionable at one time to wear socks with sandals. The old gladiator sandal, gladiator style sandals that had the buckles, two buckles across the foot up front, and they had uh, tire treads for sole. It looked like they cut them out of uh, recycled bias ply tires, and you wore socks, white socks with those. Um, that lasted about a year and a half, maybe two years. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Linda's talking about the same thing, but I just she made me remember. She said uh, they even wore them under their civilian yeah, Levi's. Civilian socks. Levi's, yeah, they so, wore white white athletic socks. Yeah. So as kids, we did that. So it, when we put on our jeans mm -hmm. under, so like nowadays, that's not the case. We've got those low socks, just low right. socks. But um, back then, if I didn't have my socks pulled almost up to my knees be, yep. beneath my, my jeans, I felt something wasn't right. And I hated when they would sort of lose the elastic and they'd start to just slide down yeah. and stuff. So that was a very normal thing for us back, back well, then. Up until just a few years ago, you couldn't get the short socks, the little anklet high socks that just barely fit into your shoes. Yeah. You couldn't get them. You had two types of socks. You had the kinds that went up to your knee, the knee high socks. Yeah. And you had the kind that went up to mid calf. I yeah. was always a mid calf guy. I didn't like socks that went up under my knee. They were just too tall. You know, <laughs> it's so exaggerated, dude. It was such an exaggeration, dude. And yet yeah. it's what people did. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, yeah, and it was you're right, it was the style, it was the trend back then. You wore, you know, you wore the high socks and you had to have the wide stripe. You know, yeah. you had two wide stripes or mm -hmm. one super wide stripe. If you got the kind with the real narrow stripes, it's like that, no does your, mother, does your mother not love you? <laughs> the the narrow stripes was uh, a no no. Yeah. And if you wore the but you see, here's the thing, it's funny because you're talking about from your neck of the woods. That same thing uh -huh. applied here. And in fact, be careful because if they were narrow, you might get beat up after class a lot. Well, but that was but that was when I was in, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade too. It was the same thing as when you were a young teen. No, I, I, you I, were, I, I was a I no. was a little kid, little baby. Well, that, well, that's what I mean though. But see, you're talking about the narrow stripes would get you beat up about how old were you talking? No, it wouldn't you? get me. See, here's, let's be clear. It wouldn't get me, but the going consensus. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, well, how old were you then? What grade? Well, what grade are we talking about? Because all my well, that's life. That's what I'm asking you. Oh, the whole so, time, really? All my life growing up. Okay, wow. We always wore the long um, mm. socks. <laughs> huh. Always. I was always a mid-calf guy. But see, I also wore up growing, grew up wearing tennis shoes, and we called them waffle stompers at the time. They were uh, logging boots or um, hiking boots, whatever. Half of my family was in the timber industry, you know, some loggers, some sawyers and what have you. But uh, so I, you know, was constantly in boots. Let, let's let's we have to pair this in, in, in. We can't leave this out. So I'll just I'll throw this out and see what you say. By the way, I wish this was part of the main uh, suit because this is such a cool. Uh, personally, I think it's fun. Yeah. Um, remember, so we're talking about the, these socks that go up to, you know, uh -huh. uh, the, whole, the holy of holy um but the shorts were super tight man and riding up they weren't oh, no. long shorts shorts uh -huh. were especially pe shorts gym shorts yeah um yeah. nobody wore like what basketball players would wear everything well even back then the shorts were riding up dude it was uh -huh. like and that and, was just not, that was just so wrong, dude. And so uh, wrong. I'll be honest, I didn't have a pair of store bought shorts until I was in my twenties, because I always made shorts out of blue jeans. My mother did, rather. Oh my goodness! Mark. She would. They were cut off blue jeans, but every kid in the neighborhood had those too. It was cut off blue jeans, and they were down about, eh, I won't say mid thigh just above mid thigh mm -hmm. but they weren't like daisy dukes or anything like that they were <laughs> you know they were longer than gym shorts yeah but not all the way down to your knee like you remember cool jams they weren't no. that long you don't remember cool jams i didn't what's what were There's, they they were shorts that ended right at the top of the knee just yes, above the top of the kneecap. Okay, they yeah. weren't that long. You got to come way back up. We wore those, and yeah. they were and they were jean, right? They had jean. Um, they were like uh, I'm sure denim. there were some, but most of them were. Uh, I'm sure there were some uh, denim ones, but most of them were the polyester colored, bright colored uh, board shorts, surfer shorts, whatever you want to call okay. them. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I never wore anything that long. But How about tank tops, Mark? Uh, yeah. Yeah, are they still in your area? Are they still um, a thing? It, tank tops? Just no, not not really. On some job sites, uh, carpenters wear them, um, painters wear them, things like that. Of course, then they throw on a long shirt if they're going to get all messed up. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, they're still a thing around here. You don't see people. You see them on a job site, but you don't see them downtown walking around. But, but it used to be the case. It, oh, yeah. It was big. And I, I, I can remember the first time I wore a tank top in front of my grandfather. He's like, what are you doing outside with your undershirt on? <laughs> and I'm yeah, like, just... what do you mean? And he said, you, you got your undershirt on outside. And how come it's blue? To him, it was you bought plain white and it was worn under your shirt. Yes. You know? But uh, we're talking about I was oh eight nine ten years old something like that tank top tank tops were a thing. Incredible. They were all I mean all over the place. We couldn't wear them in school because they had a the no arm pit thing. They didn't want to smell us either, you know. <laughs> so you had to wear a shirt with sleeves on it in school. Ensuring mutual destruction is avoided. Yeah, basically, really, basically. Um, let's see here. Um, headband. <laughs> uh, let's see. Dan says jams. Those were the stuff. How about headbands? You can ask Eloy about his attitude on headbands. No, no, hold on. Just to be clear, <laughs> I actually had headbands because remember, mm -hmm. in the eighties, you know, you emulate. I didn't emulate, um, mm -hmm. but. You, it was like wearing a, a hat sometimes. You added, I even had the freaking arm cuffs or whatever, oh, the armbands. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, um, but it people the had them. Mm -hmm. It was the stuff, so you just wear them. It's like, um, but not in the context of a rock and roll band, dude. No. So it's like, 
you know, in the context, of, you're wearing a headband. It's like, no, dude. Or like, imagine a guy wearing. Well, see, that's. I was about to say, imagine a guy wearing spandex in a rock and roll band. You just that's described like, the '80s. I just, <laughs> I, just, I just described the whole the whole darn decade. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, okay, so man. so you know, uh, what was that lady that used to do um 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 exercise and would sell? She was very famous and she got the bandana. Who was she? Well, uh, Jane Fonda, the workout was it Jane, was it Jane Fonda? Jane Fonda Jane. had the aerobics workout tape, but yeah. Olivia Newton John had the let's get physical music video. Oh, yeah, yeah, that did yeah. that whole spandex thing. But yeah. I personally, I personally will sign off on her wearing the headband and spandex. I think so too. I, I, I give that the official thumbs up. Yeah, I think that um, was cool. <laughs> but um, we're we're talking it, it we're, we're we're trying not to talk about Mark Knopfler, and he said in an interview one time that uh, the reason he adopted the headband was to keep from sweating on the front row, you know, because <laughs> I think one one girl yelled up at him one day from the front row in between songs. Ooh, give me more of that liquid swagger or something like that. Oh boy. He was sweating all over the place, you know, up on stage. So he yeah. said, well, <laughs> maybe I need to do something about this. And he didn't want to wear a hat. <laughs> so, well, anyway, um, yeah, the, uh, the headband thing in, when I was a kid, around that age headbands were associated with hippies bikers and druggies so you know i don't know if you've ever seen any cheech and chong movies but the character tommy chong portrays yeah that's who headbands were associated with really guys like that. yeah just complete tennis, stoners or bikers that's or, right but yeah. tennis players. But see, they weren't tennis bands like that. They were the rolled up bandana. We didn't oh, have. Oh, oh, oh. We oh. didn't. We didn't have the Terry headbands. Okay, that was oh. your generation. I was in my twenties and gone. By then. okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense now. Yes, yes. So yeah, it's it's a little bit of a rebellious. If you had a head, it's yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the Terry cloth one. Is more of like the 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 I'm going to play tennis today. Would you exactly. like to join me? It's more of that. <laughs> but what yes. you're talking about is like, oh, these guys are into some bad stuff. Right. They're right. wearing they're wearing a they're wearing that. Uh-uh. Yeah. They were they were meant for druggies, hippies, bikers, and uh bums, you know. Yeah. Um Snow Crusher saying Axel Rose, not worn like that. Not the not the real wide thing that covered you know like that. It was it was narrow, about maybe inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half. You folded it up, tied it around back, you know, and you never wore it pulled back over your head like Joe Walsh likes to do. That was for women. Axel yeah. Rose was the perfect example here in Sweetwater back then mm -hmm. of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. walking down the road to the T looking like rockers leather jackets here um, or denim sometimes that with all mm -hmm. the rock band you know patches on them and stuff mm -hmm. and they just looked to me so cool dude these were the older brothers of friends and stuff and we'd be like the little snots right and we'd uh -huh. look at these people and they were walking with their girlfriends we're like they have girlfriends and everything oh my goodness they wow. looked so quintessential rock and roll of that time dude that it was very it was See, very visually like it, it, it ingrains itself into into one's head um incredible i don't remember anything like that spreading in school um in, in the 70s, it was all about T-shirts and blue jeans. It really was. If you wore a, a, a buttoned-up shirt with a collar, you were a dork. You were a nerd. And 
you weren't associated with except by other nerds. I didn't have a leather jacket, but I had a denim jacket. I wore that mm -hmm. constantly, all the time. No patches sewn on it. Because it was, that was kind of, that was for the bikers again. You know, they would cut the sleeves off the jacket. So it was just like a, a denim vest. Patches all over it. And yeah. you had to have that separation. You know, there were a few kids that didn't. They wanted that image. But yeah. it was all about 100% about casual. You know, um, blue jeans, T-shirts, sneakers, occasionally boots. Um if your shoes had laces, they had better be sneakers. You know, is you did the amount of shoe polish with boots, notwithstanding the amount of shoe polish used in a standard high school classroom was like zero, you know? Yeah. Now, if, if you wore boots, especially engineer boots and engineer boots were the kind that had the chrome ring around the ankle had a strap that went around the back and a strap that kind of went down uh, to the sole and then across the front. Those were cool. Cowboy boots were cool. But square-toed cowboy boots, not the pointy toes. Square point? Yes. And that was this was in California. Texas, whole other country. I had black cowboy boots in high school mm -hmm. and with jeans and rock and roll shirts. Um it had that, I guess, that metal piece that goes around the. Uh, I, I pulled, I took that off completely because I thought it was too sparkly. I uh -huh. just wanted just death black, you know? Yeah. It, it do with the. And, and there were some other guys that did wear some with snake. Um, and it was, and it, it was that. And it, it was an extension of what we were saw when we were kids with the rockers. Mm hmm that grew up in the area and we just continued the extension of that. Um, the only the crap. <laughs> well, the only way you could tell the rockers from anybody else in, you know, junior high and high school when I was growing up was the rockers had the uh, rock and roll t-shirts on. They had the pink Floyd or, yeah. you know, Boston or Leonard Skinner or whatever t-shirts on. Everybody else had, you know, whatever that such and such surf shop or Chevy or Volkswagen or whatever. I mean, lots yeah. of car hot rod art on T-shirts. And I was that guy. Hot rods and motorcycles. Last question I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Okay. We'll, we'll end with this since we're, we're running. You know, um, okay. In your recollection. Uh-huh. I was going to say, did you shoot that woman? Uh, in your recollection, mm -hmm. when was the first time that T-shirt actual logo design started to appear on people's? Because there had to be a time before that that was not um, part of it. Um, I didn't really pay all that much attention growing up. I vaguely remember t-shirts with something written on them but even when i was real young t-shirts weren't they were worn on job sites but they you didn't see people walking down the street in a t-shirt you wore a button-up shirt with a collar or maybe a pullover but t-shirts were for that was what you worked in wait a second no. wait a second t-shirt Mm -hmm. And pull over. Wait a second. To me, a t-shirt and a pullover is the same. A pullover has a collar and may have two or three buttons right here. But it's like your uh, golf shirts is what we would call them now. Remember? Oh, the you're saying like, 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 um, a sweater, a turtleneck. That's a pullover. Really? That's what? Yeah. So, okay. But, but t-shirts weren't really worn outside they were worn underneath other clothing and then they started getting more and more prevalent and icons and art started appearing on them 
the first t-shirt I can remember getting that had any printing on it, I was probably, I think I was either eight or nine. So we're looking at 69 or 70. And I wore that to school, but I was the only one. I mean, everybody else, you had school clothes and you had play clothes. And the T-shirt thing borderlined into play clothes. So, you know? Linda is saying that... Okay. Yeah, T-shirts with logos on them first came out in the 60s, 70s. Think band T-shirts. Yeah. It, it was... I, I was eight or nine. And in fact, one day in a hangout, I found the T-shirt... The, the transfer, the iron-on transfer for the first T-shirt I ever bought showed it to you guys. I know it in the 70s there mm -hmm. were. Yeah. The question is, between the early 70s and into the 60s, when necessarily that would have pop, popped up? But you remember it early on in school. I, Well, like I said, I wore that one T-shirt with what it was, was it was when... Um, uh, Easy Rider was still a thing. That was and like 71, it was, no? It was the Captain America chopper. And behind it in big letters, it said Easy Rider on it. And I wore that t-shirt to school. And my <laughs> friends in class were like, whoa! You know? They loved it? It was not subtle. I mean, now think of an eight or nine-year-old kid. And this thing is sized for an adult T-shirt, so it went from my neck to my navel. They I mean, they must have been blown away. They, they were, and because <laughs> nobody else wore a printed T-shirt, it just didn't happen. Yeah, it just didn't happen. But I did it anyway. I didn't get in trouble for it. Nobody said anything about it. Right. You the probably teacher, didn't look. The teacher kind of looked at it a little funny, but I only wore it that once, and then I wore it. I wore it out and played around and what have you. Yeah, your teachers probably didn't think that you were. A danger to society at that no, moment. No, no you know, I wasn't. This little kid is, you know, he's he is being a little bit. Uh, uh, he he's pu a pushing little, it a little a bit. A little flamboyant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, the movie Easy Rider was 1969. Okay, so uh, if that's yeah. so, well, this would have been after, obviously. So yeah, so figure 1969, 1970. So I would have been nine or ten. I was in. I want to say it was in fourth grade. If they were doing that for the movie at that time, that means that we're looking at the 60s for that type of print shirt. Yeah. Because yeah. they couldn't have been the first ones. Because we went to the San Jose flea market. That was a big thing in the Bay Area of uh, California. San Jose flea market builds itself as the uh, world's largest flea market. Whether they are or not, I don't know. But that's what they like to say. And it is huge. And there's everything from outlet stores within the borders. Mm -hmm. And I say outlet stores. They're small, built in, like, it looks like a storage unit. Mm -hmm. But you roll up the door and there's your outlet. I mean, and they're selling all kinds of merchandise. Everything from that all the way down to the guy who has a, trying to get rid of his garage sale stuff. Who just, you know, um, throws a blanket on the ground or a sheet on the ground and lays out a bunch of stuff and sits there next to his car, you know. Yeah, and there was a booth set up that was printing these T-shirts, and they had designs all over the place, but most of it to do with hot rods and motorcycles, and I just loved that one. So, so you remember the? Yeah. Oh yeah, but that was the first printed T-shirt I got, and it kind of went downhill from there because that's all I wanted after that was just printed T-shirts. But these were El Cheapos. You know, it was the heat transfer, the vinyl heat transfer that you had to turn inside out and wash, and then you couldn't dry it. You had to let it air dry. Right. The dryer. And um, it lasted, I don't know, just a plain white t shirt. You did, couldn't even pick your color. All you could do was pick your size. And, um, but after that, that's what I wanted. I wanted printed t shirts, and I had a ton of them. I occasionally wore a pullover or I occasionally wore a button-up shirt with a collar, but predominantly I was in T-shirts. I mean, it's just the comfort and it's, yeah. it's I don't know, man. It's mm -hmm. uh, Snow Crusher says, 
a few Joe Cocker t-shirts. I don't want to really get into it, but Joe Cocker's first three albums or two or three albums were just classics all the way. My favorite was Mad Dogs and Englishmen. You see, I liked the with a little help from a friends, and there were a couple of them where they had a couple of Beatles tunes in each one of his first early albums. Those mm -hmm. early albums were very, I guess, it almost, it was very um, 60s, a good vibe. With, you know, I enjoyed those first three. And afterwards, not so much. I, I had, don't remember uh, Mad Dog and, and Englishman. I don't remember it necessarily. I remember the cover, but I don't remember the, the song listings in it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Rick French says got his first and T-shirt. Okay. At a Chicago concert in 1973. Oh, I got to right. tell you, that is the first real big fad band T-shirt that I remember seeing was Chicago. And it was just that word in their logo across the T-shirt. I remember seeing those all over the place. Okay, your first band T-shirt at a con Chicago concert. Okay, he corrected himself. I remember that being a fad, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't really care. But I, I thought, this many people moved from Chicago? I was thinking the city. I was a little kid. But that's the first band. Yeah, that's the first band T-shirt that I really remember. And the other one was... Um, um, the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon album cover. That was all over the place with no writing on it at all, front or back. Just that prism with the uh, light going in one side and yeah. the uh, uh, rainbow coming out the other side. Yeah. So those that were early on. Huge. Yeah. But that album came out in, what, 73, I think. So printed T-shirts were a thing. But those are the yeah. first real band T-shirts that I remember because I wasn't as into music back then as as I became later on. Yeah, it it, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, T-shirts like that, mm -hmm. and it was a big deal for decades. Yes, and I think yes. it's still. I don't know. If it's a big deal, but I think it's still. Like I still wear my <laughs> rock and roll shirts <laughs> like incessantly. And I'm gonna be honest with you. When I go out, and, and I've thought of this when I go out and about to do my stuff i rarely see anyone with a rock and roll t-shirt so i must be fashionably um obsolete <laughs> i might be terribly f no don't even don't even go dude i don't see other people wearing rock shirts dude i am so you know that the old the old men from when you were young the old guys the old, old retirees and they would wear the checkered thing i might be be coming the equivalent of the checkered plaid pants and stuff without knowing it dude <laughs> because i don't see no one i don't see anyone with rock and roll shirts around here i i i see them um they're but then again they're not really they're not really they're not the band logos that we're used to so maybe that's what you're missing. You know, maybe it's bands that you and I just don't follow. We just don't know the names of. Dude, honestly, now, and I, I dude, I am completely out of touch with, with popular culture to a degree, oh, but to a degree that it's like, I'm, but I'm thinking to myself, dude, I, this conversation, I have not seen a rock shirt on anybody. In fact, I'm going to be frank. I don't even pay attention to what the hell people wear. Yeah. I don't look at what they wear. There might be a bunch of that. Yeah. There might be a bunch of that. Well, you know, now we're in that stretch of weather here in Oregon where everybody has gone into their jacket, so you can't really see what T-shirt they're wearing, if they're wearing a T-shirt at all. So, you know. Um, okay. <laughs> Eloy is the polka of the 2020s. Okay. <laughs> and you want you want to know something funny? I was actually listening to I'm not joking Steve. I was actually listening to Polka the other day because I don't know 
I just got interested. I wanted to see the thing. So, so uh, point made. No, but yeah. dude, seriously, seriously, um, I, I showed it. I showed it to you the other day in a hangout. I've got a Monsters of Rock concert T-shirt from 1991. Yeah, it's got I, all the good bands. Yeah, uh, Metallica, Queensrÿche, AC/DC. Um, that concert was set up on our airfield when we were stationed over in Germany. And in fact, the stage was set up right out the back of the hangar my wife worked in. So we, you know, of course went to the concert, but, uh, right, right. I was on, I was on guard duty for the first two, for the first, let's see, the black crows opened and then Motley Crue played. And, uh, I was up in the, uh, air traffic control tower on guard duty, you know, with binoculars scanning the crowd, you know, and uh, then my relief came and I got to go out. We went, you know, to the concert. Things were That's cool. awesome. But uh, that was a lot of fun. All right. Let's wrap this up, man. Cause I've okay. got myself a, we're on the verge there with yeah. the timing. Okay. Well, we're past the, we're, we're past the, we're, we're past the verge. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot for joining us, everyone. Little programming note. So if you didn't hang around, you'll find out next week. Uh, tomorrow morning, I go in to have some serious uh, dental work done. And so there may not be a recording next week. Okay, it's not 100%. It's going to depend on how the old uh, choppers are doing because I'm having some pretty extensive work done. And uh, it's just going to depend on whether or not I can talk. So, uh, but we should be back. So that will be next Sunday. We won't be here. That's the, excuse me, next Tuesday. We won't be here. That's the 23rd. We should okay. be back on the 30th. So, so there will not be a recording next week. Oh, right. it's official then. Uh, probably not. We'll see okay. what happens, but probably not. So don't get your hopes up. <laughs> okay. Have a good night, guys. All right. Take care, y'all. Thanks for joining us.